Hey, good afternoon, Realtors. Uh, thank you for joining us for the next uh, in our series of, of webinars. We're excited to, uh, to present our guest today. Um, and this is going to be a treat. Uh, I hope that all of you uh, are able to tune in live today. And those of you that are watching this at a later time, uh, stay in till, till the very end, because uh, I think there's uh, a lot to get out of, a lot of uh, takeaways from the presentation today that I think will be very pertinent and timely as, as we transition from one phase to another uh, in our industry, in our real estate industry here in South Carolina. So, you know, from working with uh, Hollywood and music stars like Woody Harrelson and, and Rod Stewart, Near discovered something that may shock you. Uh, these creative superstars aren't all that different from you or I. You know, their wallets may be a little bit bigger, but they're just like us. It's just that uh, they've mastered a, a method of, of repeatability and predictable creativity. Uh, uh, and that's a, a type of creativity that, that anyone can learn. And it turns out that that's the same type of creativity that can be used in your real estate business and in your real estate career. Uh, Nier has taught uh, thousands of leaders and individuals around the globe how to harness the power of creativity to improve profitability, increase sales, boost customer service, and ultimately create more meaning in their work. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about that customer experience. And uh, he's worked with clients, uh, some, some big Fortune 500s, uh, AT&T, Microsoft, uh, the NFL and, and many others. Um, and he spent the last two, two decades working on a formula to, to codify, to codify, uh, I should say, creativity for business. That formula is found in the Creator Mindset, a book which has been translated into uh, several languages and released worldwide by McGraw-Hill uh, in August of, of 2020. Uh, Realtors, I know you're going to enjoy the presentation today. Thank you for tuning in. And please help me welcome Nir Bashan uh, to our SCR webinar series today. Nir, welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Nick. Thanks for having me. Uh, your, you and your team have been really wonderful. Uh, Chelsea's been absolutely amazing to work with, an incredible uh, experience so far. And I hope, um, I hope that today we can focus on creativity a little bit and understand why it's so important. Now, look, I've been working with real estate and realty groups for a, a while now, commercial and residential. And I think right now we're in the middle of a boom time, right? Everything is going really well. And I, I just did a keynote for the Mortgage Collaborative and they asked me near, you know, it's great. We love creativity. This is wonderful. But why now? Like where everything is good. We don't really, we're heads down. We got to write, you know, offers and all of this great stuff. And we're moving at lightning speed right now, just trying to keep up with that demand. Well, the thing is, is that this is something that will not last forever. Anybody who's been in the business long enough knows that it's a cyclical business, right? And there's ups, and there's down. And just because we're at an up point right now doesn't mean that the SCR membership can't keep it going up even when the market comes down. There are ways to keep everything at full throttle and everything doing as good as humanly possible, even when the market starts to come down and, and kind of bottom out as well. The difference between realtors who are using creativity and those who are not using creativity is exactly that, that ability to do well and to weather the storm, no matter what the storm will bring. So I, I deeply thank you for having me on, Nick, and, and Chelsea, thank you so much. And I hope that we have some great takeaways from today. I'm going to go through uh, just setting up why creativity is so important in the first place, which is, I think, going to act as a foundation for our discussion. And then I'm going to go through 10 steps of creativity that are not particularly in any type of order, but these are steps that 
I think y'all can use right now, right? You're looking at this and, and maybe you're hearing me on, on uh, Facebook and you're thinking, okay, Nir, I can grab a couple of things. I'm really busy, but what are those couple of things that I can grab and kind of move forward to be creative, especially to plant the seeds now for the eventuality of things kind of going from super duper hot to maybe red hot to maybe, okay, it's hot to up medium, up, maybe it's slowing down and, and all of those eventualities that will come to fruition sooner or later. Let's decide right now y'all to plant the seeds for our future no matter what the market brings through the use of creativity so let's go through why creativity is so important and this really boils down to our dna right creativity is literally a part of who we are as human beings creativity as i define it is about the ability to solve problems unlike anybody can solve them other than you. The ability to solve problems unlike anybody else can solve them other than you. What we have done is we have overdeveloped the analytical part of our mind and we've underdeveloped the creative part of our mind. And what ends up happening is we are so inundated with numbers and spreadsheets and comps and everything that we're looking at every day in terms of, well, you know, if, if it sold for this much last month, then it must sell for this much plus 5% next month. And all of these analytical things have trapped us in a way into thinking with only half of our potential. So we'll be talking a lot today about how important creativity is not only to plant the seeds for tomorrow for the eventuality of what will happen when the economy is not so good, but also to improve the customer service, improve your approach to day-to-day -to -day interactions with people that you work with as a realtor. So creativity is literally embedded into our DNA. What has happened is 50, 60, 70,000 years ago, there was a woman named Harriet. And Harriet was being attacked by a beast, right? They you know, had big fangs and, you know, it's far more powerful than us. And she ran into a cave. And this is when, you know, people would live to like 23, right? You'd be a grandma at 23. And she ran into this cave and this beast was attacking. And she saw a stick and it was, it was raining, right? So there was a flood. There's, you know, it's, I mean, the worst case scenario, right? Dark and stormy night. And the water's coming up and she sees the stick that was nothing but a walking stick, okay? And then she sees a berry picker, you know, kind of like an arrowhead or whatnot, that was nothing but a berry picker. And she got the idea in that very moment to take that stick and put the arrowhead on top of it. And she created a weapon that allowed her to kind of, you know, fight off the beast and in fighting off the beast, she generated the world's first creative idea. Now, that creativity is still deeply ingrained in who we are today, and it literally makes us human beings because we are able to be creative. We are able to solve problems unlike anybody else has ever done. It is innately related to our survival. When we are creative, we maintain a survivability that is part and parcel to the human experience. Without creativity, there would be no people, there would be nothing that we know today as a comfortable life, there would be no real estate business, and there would be no structure of humanity today. But because we are creative, it's deeply ingrained in who we are. We are now a civilized people where we have wonderful businesses and all of these amazing DNA elements deep within us. And what happens is we have it. We all have it. Everybody on this webinar today, everybody listening to me, we are all creative. And this is not about music or art or painting or sculpture. It's not about that kind of creativity. It's about the ability to solve problems as you can only solve those problems, right? So we're born with creativity thin our DNA. My son is about four and a half now, and he gets 
packages on Amazon, right? He gets toys. So we, you know, we buy him some stuff on Amazon. He ships it out. He literally takes the box, right? Opens it, takes the toy out of the box, places it next to, you know, next to the box and ends up playing with the box for hours, right? The box is an airplane. It's a spaceship. It's a, you know, a hiding place. It's a castle. It's all of these wonderful things. And we need to rediscover that sense of, anything it's possible, that sense that creativity can get us wherever we need to go. And that is especially, especially important in business today because we are distant from that quick and wonderful ability that we had as children to be creative. We must reestablish our creative roots, not necessarily relearn it. It is not about oh, you know, near, I'm not a creative person. That's not for me. I, I'm an analytical person. I study, you know, comps all day and price homes or whatever it is that you do. Okay, but just because you do that doesn't mean that you're also creative. You need to rediscover that creativity that we had as children. They've done tons of study, and, and I talk about it in my book, where, you know, babies, before they even develop language skills, right? They, they can't even talk. And they develop creative problem solving by, you know, putting a Cheerio in a bottle and a baby, any baby anywhere on earth can get that Cheerio out using creative means before they can even language uh, say or ask for or want that Cheerio. They know how to take it and flip it over and put it through the thing and get the Cheerio out so that they can eat it. It is innate to humanity. We all have it and we need to start to use it. So what ends up happening when we are not creative, right? What ends up happening is society is at a complete and utter loss. We end up not being able to be at full potential. We could have easily, easily have cured cancer by now. We could have landed a woman on Mars. We could have solved pollution, air pollution problem. But what ends up happening, and maybe this happens in your business, what ends up happening is somebody comes up with a really, really good idea. And they say to themselves, you know what? I've got a really good idea. And I, I really want to do this. This is going to be great. And then a minute or two goes by and they literally talk themselves out of it, right? Like, oh, why would I do that? You know, that's not normal. Or, you know, what are, what are they going to think of me? And, you know, I've worked for 25 years developing my business. I have a wonderful real estate organization with several uh, realtor working for me. And, you know, I've got this whole setup and why would I risk that on an idea? Well, what ends up happening is when we are not taking a leap of faith on our innate creativity that we all have, society is at a loss, I'm at a loss. And when we actually do take initiative to have creative ideas, then we have all kinds of organizations and companies and wonderful contributions to society that come from mainly creative impetus that comes from a creative idea. So to sum this up, Creativity is an incredibly important attribute to business, no matter what you do. Don't worry. It's not about music or art or anything like that. Don't worry. It's not about, oh, you know, I have to be, uh, I have to walk every day at two o'clock and align my chakras and meditate and all that stuff. If that works for you and you are having creative ideas, go for it, right? If that works, fantastic. But for the rest of us that that doesn't work for, I will go through 10 things just right now, 10 things that you can do. And I'm hoping you pick one or two of them or five of them or six, seven, eight of them and apply them to your business today, right now. And what you will find is that these creative sparks, right, that are able to be practiced and learned are really about an art form of doing. It's not about waiting for inspiration to strike. It's not about this, you know, she, she stuff. It is really a practicable and obtainable art form of creativity. So really wonderful. Very, very excited to dive in. Okay. So now we're going to talk about how to be more creative 
at work. One of the things that you can do starting today is start to monitor your little victories. The little victories are all about measuring things slowly but surely and obtaining a goal before moving on to the next. Most people that I work with in, in my consulting practice, and I've run several companies uh, over the years, uh, multi-million dollar companies, what ends up happening is we sit around and we set a three-year, we set a five-year, we set a 10-year goal. And nobody gets anywhere until that goal is met. It's just like, we'll wait three years and then we'll celebrate the little victory or whatnot. We need to redefine success in terms of actionable and measurable goal. Footsteps that lead somewhere are way more important than setting a three-year or a five-year or a 10-year and then just saying, okay, I'm waiting till I get there. Now, there was a ice cream salesman many, many, many years ago who wanted to sell as many ice cream machines as humanly possible. And so he had a very analytical construct, which is what most people do. They go to business school or, you know, they work somewhere for a while, they develop an analytical mindset. And so his told him, okay, in order to sell a bunch of machines, I need, uh, you know, to call people and I need to get a list and then I'm going to go out there and get on the phone and do whatever I need to do to sell a bunch of machines. So what ended up happening was like any analytical goal, it went up for a while, right? But then it leveled off because when we don't use both parts of the mind as a supercomputer, we will always hit a limit. We always hit what I call the analytical limit. So indeed, this happened to this guy. He hit the limit. He set his three year, he set his five year to sell, you know, a million machines at three year, tell 10 million machines that, you know, the five year goal, whatever it was. And so one day he noticed that there was a restaurant in California that kept ordering machines. These were machines that they were using for, um, uh, you know, uh, milkshakes, right? So they were using it for milkshake machines and that sort of thing. And he noticed that this restaurant kept ordering them because they were breaking because they were making so many dang milkshakes. And he thought to himself, you know what? I've got an idea. This is a creative idea. I'm going to get on a plane, go out there and see what they're doing. Right? I'm going to see what they're doing and see if there's anything there for me. Now, most people would never do that. Most people would say, ah, it's an anomaly. Yeah, who cares? You know, analytically, it makes no sense. You got to you know, pay for a flight and you got to get a rental car and drive out. And why would you do that? You're spending you know, good money after bad money and all of these analytical things that would prevent you from doing that. So this guy said, you know what? I'm going to do it because I, I, I want to get creative. He goes out there and he finds that there's a line around the block, 45 minutes of people waiting to get to the restaurant. And he waits in line. He gets to the counter and he discovers that it's the best cheeseburger he's had in his entire life, right? The best cheeseburger. And the guy's name was Ray Kroc. And that restaurant was McDonald's. So imagine what is going on in your career today in your business, that you are just flying by at 300 miles an hour, not paying attention to redefining the little successes? Is it the customer service that you're super good at? Is it the um, paperwork at the end of the closing? Is it What is it in your job or in your career or in your practice that you're seeing do extraordinarily well? And what are you blasting past because you're like, ah, whatever, who cares? It's, you know, it's just part of the job or it's not that important. So when we look at these things and we explore them a little bit, we start to recognize that these little successes, what I call little victories, might just take us somewhere that is not part of the three-year or part of the five-year. Those things just might be way better than the original goal that we set. This is incredibly important right now in a boom time where things are going really well. Because of the eventuality of the cyclical nature of our business, one day, maybe soon, maybe not, one day things will start to change. And when they change, 
we need to be ready to redefine our success path. And so being flexible and being able to follow those little victories just might take you to an area that is outside of your comfort zone or outside of the area that you thought that you'd end up in. Very important to allow those little victories to guide you along your way and help you get to where you need to go, regardless of whether you thought that that's where you needed to go in the first place. Ray Kroc could have sold ice cream machines his whole life. And the fact that he was willing to take a leap of faith on creativity and understand that creativity is that important, his three-year or five-year to sell a bunch of machines has gotten wildly eclipsed by the fact that he took a leap on creativity. And I completely advise you to do the same. Look at what's happening in your business. Take a leap on creativity anytime that you possibly, possibly can. So another really great creative tool is what I like to call the digital detox. We are going at a million miles an hour nonstop. We got our phones, we got our computers, we got, you know, TV and streaming and apps and all of this stuff coming at us nonstop all the time. We need to figure out a way to shut it down once in a while. Now, what ends up happening, I promise you guys, what ends up happening is if you don't schedule your time in an appropriate way, somebody else will schedule it for you. You need to make sure that you own your day, that you own the process that you have going, that you own your workflow. Because if you don't, a client will come in there and say, I need you to do this. And I need a three hour walkthrough and we need an inspector and you need to be there for that. And all of the things that pop up when we don't carefully plan our day. Part of carefully planning our day is the art of occasionally shutting it down. Now, I am super guilty of this one because this is something that I have uh, a lot of problems with, a lot. I'll be honest, it's just very, very hard for me. But once in a while, what I do, and it helps tremendously, is shut it down. This is what I recommend. Open your calendars right now. If you're in front of a computer or if you're in front of uh, uh, your phone and you got stuff, you know, on, on here, um, Outlook or however you track your calendar, schedule 15 minutes this week. Uh, well, tomorrow's Friday, but maybe next week, schedule 15 minutes, a block out of time and call it me time. Do it right now. Go ahead. I will wait. Schedule 15 minutes of me time next week. And during that me time, have a little bit of bandwidth to close your computer, close the phone, and take 15 minutes of break. What that does is it recalibrates your brain to allow you to have a moment of silence, right? And not constantly be bombarded from every which way by information, text, phone calls, and all of this stuff. Now, what you do during that 15 minutes is look at the week following it and then schedule 30. Now, I know you guys are like, near no no way can i take a half hour out of a week because of it's crazy right now and i need to be working i get it but the more that we allow ourselves time to recalibrate time to detox time to get off of social right i love so i'm on insta all the time i just love it i like pictures and pictures and pictures and you get kind of like whoa and it's mesmerizing it's like nonstop. If we allow ourselves blocks of time that we're scheduling right now to disconnect, we end up with creativity. What ends up happening is the mind says, wait a second, I don't have to run. I don't have to race. Oh, yeah, that deal. Yeah, this is how we should structure it, right? And, oh, I know what I should do on this next listing. And oh, that realtor, I need to partner with her. We can do something amazing together. It allows your, your mind to have some time to really connect with what is going on and the ability to solve problems. Another thing that I really, really, really like is 
the creative ability to switch gear. Now, I've done a lot of workshops with, with different folks where they tell me, Nir, come on in because we are a multitasking organization. We do a million things and we need to get organized, right? We need to get organized in how we do a million things. And I tell them, okay, what is it that you're looking for? And they say, Nir, this is, uh, we need to get more efficient. We need to get more efficient. And I say, yeah, cool. What do you got to get more efficient about? They're like, well, you know, we have, so we have, we multitask, we get a million things done and we're just like going, going, going all the time. So help us get more done in a shorter amount of time. And I say, okay, that I'm comfortable doing. And what I do is I prepare a full workshop, a couple hours, an hour and a half of an exercise where I give people a sheet of paper and I ask them to write down a series of numbers. And I say, okay, flip over the paper, write down a series of letters and you know we time it and this kind of stuff. And then I say, okay, now what we're gonna do is a multitask activity. And we multitask where we do a letter and a number, a letter and a number. And people are like, yeah, yeah, I can do this really great. And we time it. And then at the end of the whole thing, right? We, we look at what times we had and every single place that I've done this at and every single group that I've ever practiced this multitasking with, uh, activity with every single place in the world. I've done it in Eastern Europe and you know West Europe here in the US, Mexico, Canada. Every single group takes on average twice as long to three times as long to multitask rather than the focus on one thing and do it completely. I beg you, in order to manifest creativity in all that you do, switch gears instead of multitask. Okay. I know you guys are going to hate this. We're going to get some emails and you know, it, it's going to be tough, but when we are able to focus on one thing at a time and complete that one thing at a time to our best ability, our creativity performance level increases dramatically. Now you ask me why, why near did that happen? Why, when I'm multitask, am I not getting a million different ideas and creativity? Well, what happens is when you multitask, it's number one, impossible to do. So nobody can really do it anyway, right? And number two is when you multitask, you miss certain details that you need to focus on absolutely and essentially in order to do a good job at whatever it is that you're doing in the first place, right? So I beg of you to take this particular tool and use it immediately after this webinar. Start to look at your calendar, look at your day, look at your appointment. Do one thing well, do it to the full, fullest of your God-given ability and move on to the next one. Switching gears and switching them often can be an amazing creative tool that will allow you to come up with really great ideas because your brain and your body is meant to focus on one thing at a time and complete it to the best of your ability. Now, you might say to me, Nir, that's great, right? But I have like a million things to do, right? So what do I do? Now, switching gears is not a timed process, right? So you could tell me, uh, in theory, you can be on one thing for 10 seconds and then be on another for 20 seconds. If you're the kind of person that needs constant go, 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 no problem. Don't multitask, just switch gears really, really fast. But when you are in that 10 second mode, go heads down on focusing on what's in front of you during that time. If you are able to focus on what's in front of you at that time, I promise you, you will see amazing creative result today, right now. If you use it, you will see amazing creative results. Um, here's another one that I really like. This one is about developing our listening skills. This one is something that I think is really, really important. We spend most of our lives kind of getting information out, right? We talk or we, we tell people, look, here's a listing. And we put balloons up and, and we knock in a stake and open house and all this stuff. And we're constantly constantly putting out what we think is important, what we think is right to do. 
what ends up happening is we lose an amazing ability to be creative by listening. Now, this is not my usual thing. Yes, I do keynotes. Yes, I do workshops and stuff. When I consult, I sit there and I listen. I listen to what's going on in the business. I listen to what people are saying. I listen to the real meaning behind what people are saying, which is often not <laughs> what people are saying in the first place, right? You have to be able to listen in order to be creative. And sometimes what you're listening for is completely the subtext of the conversation, not you know the main thing that's going on. That subtext relates to another incredibly important creative tool, which is the soft skill element. Because we are so analytically trained, we have kind of forgotten and given up in a way on soft skills, right? We can attribute whether somebody is empathetic or somebody is really, really um, good at a particular part of their job. We can't quantify it, so we say it doesn't exist, right? We are so used to attaching a number, attaching a number or a measurement to something. And if we can't attach a measurement or a number to something, then it must not exist. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. We need to start to do a lot more listening. And in that listening, we need to do what I like to call critical listening, which is really paying attention to not only the words and what's coming out of somebody's mouth or whatnot, it's also how they're saying it and what they mean and what the context of the conversation is. If you were to just do this out of all 10 skills that you'll learn today, if you were just to practice this for a month in your business, you will realize that your sales will grow, your referrals will go through the roof, and your ability to relate to people will be incredibly elevated. Why? It's because everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to understand, uh, be understood. And it, it's just one of those human elements that everybody has a need for in that we have to get much better at providing. We are largely in a customer service business. This is what we do day in and day out. We help people get blank investment property, blank, uh, their own real estate, blank, a uh, uh, dream house, on and on, a uh, commercial property. It, we help people literally facilitate a certain activity. And when we are able to really listen, when we are able to understand what that person is really going through, even if we don't have an answer for it, even if we don't say something, that person will feel like, wow, you know, uh, I'm getting my voice heard and it's important. Now, understanding the ability of, of humans, of us as service providers to be able to use our ears to critically listen is the first step. The second step is we have to understand through listening that there is a lot of soft skills out there that we need to get better at both practicing and understanding when they come in. So soft skills, incredibly, incredibly important. Critical listening is incredibly important and understanding how the two things come together, also really important. Before we go off this slide, I'd like to give you guys one more note here. Albert Einstein was saying that uh, he had a famous quote and he said that not all things that are, and, and I'm, I'm butchering it, right? I'm butchering, I'm trying to remember it. But he said that not all things that can be quantified are worth attaching a number to. And there is nothing more important in our business today than our relationship with one another, not only uh, customer facing, but also within our organization and the way that we treat each other in even in a competition uh, basis. I remember many years ago, I was running an advertising agency in Los Angeles and, you know, people were like, uh, why would you ever engage with somebody that's not in-house or something like that. And I said, you know what? I want, I'm going to call the competitor because I want to find out what they're doing. It ended up 
a multi-year relationship with them because they were going through the same exact thing that I was going through. And, you know, we were able to, if not lessen the competition, we were able to build empathy. And that empathy is carried with me to this day. Don't leave options off the table when they come to soft skills. So the next one here is all about choosing positivity and it dovetails really nicely into the message that, um, that I want to, uh, to get across. Um, this is a, a really, really interesting topic. And we talked about it at length in the book where we looked at different cultures throughout the world and we sort of saw that there is a crisis of description, a crisis of language in the world today. I thought that it was only in the US. I thought, listen, you know, I watched the media, I turn on TV here. You think that like the world's going to, you know, all heck in a handbasket, right? It, it, based on what you hear. And I thought, this has to be an English language construction. There is no way that this is, you know, a worldwide thing. I'm sure that English has more bad words to pick from than good words. So I did some research. I had a great team while writing the book, and uh, we were able to do a lot of research. And we found the ratio in the U.S., in, in English, in England, too, of bad words to good words is six to one. Okay, six to one meaning that for every positive word there is in English, there are six negative ones, six, okay? So for every happy, there's sad, depressed, terrible, horrible, and all of these negative languages, uh, negative words that we use in our language to describe the things that are bad. So I urge you to choose positivity in your language Every single time that you can, that is a incredible creative tool. And it's something that's really easy to do. I also said, I bet you that this is not a worldwide thing, right? And, and to go to my point, we looked at it, I think at across something like 20 or 30 different countries, about 20 or 30 different languages. We did a, an international study all the way from Southeast Asia to you know, Portugal and, and, and uh, Brazil. We found that this six to one ratio exists in every single language that we looked at on earth. Every single language has more ways to describe negative things than to describe positive things. And the impetus is on us to start to choose very, very carefully our words. Great, Nir. What does that mean and how do I use it today? Okay, so if there is a negotiation that's going wrong, right? Everybody's five or 10% over today. At least they are here in Orlando where I am. It's amazing. Stuff goes on the market in residential real estate in Orlando right now at the time of this recording and people are coming in 10 15% above asking, and it's craziness, right? It's, you know, people are, are doing a home inspection before they even close, and it's just wild. So I ask you, what type of language would you use to describe that situation? You could say, oh, things are nuts and, you know, hectic. Oh, it's incredibly, you know, stressful and all of this stuff. Or you can look at the positive of it. You could say, you know what? Instead of choosing the word hectic or stressful, I'm going to say it's busy. Or instead of choosing the word, oh, you know, things are crazy and, ah, uh, you know, I'm lost and overwhelmed, you choose the word, you know what, I'm dedicated to this. I am more focused on what is going on today than I was before. When we are able to choose our language, we are able to tip the outcome in a person listening or even in writing we are able to tip the outcome into our favor of creativity. If you guys just use this one, right? This choose positivity. Next time you're writing up a listing, next time you're sending an email to a colleague or a coworker or one of your employees, use the language of positivity instead of using the language of negativity. And you will instantly unleash this really wonderful, 
creativity initiative where somebody reading or listening to you will be like, wow, hey, that's that's a pretty cool way to describe an otherwise pretty crappy situation. It's possible. It is really about how you choose your words. And next time something bad happens or overwhelming or hectic or crazy, choose your language wisely. And I think you will be able to yield incredible results from just that slight change into positivity. Next one I want to cover with you guys is help somebody today. This is one of those creative tools that will allow you to step out of what is comfortable and go into something that might be a little bit different, new, fresh, and exciting. I'll give you guys a little story. Uh, in 1997, Apple was going out of business, all right? They, they kicked Steve Jobs off of the board and, you know, Bill Gates and Microsoft was exploding, just going really, really well. Apple doubled down on a product that nobody wanted. I think it was the Newton. I can't remember, but they doubled down on a product nobody wanted. And instead of kind of cutting it loose and moving on, they were like, no, we need to spend more time and money and marketing on this product. People are going to love it. Yeah, well, that doesn't really happen, right? So they kind of got blinded by that and were about to go out of business. The last ditched effort of the board was to bring Steve Jobs back in. And a lot of people don't know the story, but it's important. What ended up happening is Steve Jobs came in and he looked at the analytics and they were dire. I mean, I'm talking three months to being out of business, right? They had two months of payroll. Then they had a loan that they were going to take to make payroll, pay for the buildings, all of the expenses. And then three months, four months later, whatever, dude, done. We're done. That's it. Out of business. And Steve said to himself, who's a really creative guy, I got to kind of step out of my comfort zone, right? And get a little bit creative here. So what he did was he went to Bill Gates, who, you know, they were friends for, for many years uh, before they kind of split. <clears throat> went to his house and literally there's no recording of the meeting and nothing really exists because neither of them ever talked about it. Uh, one is no longer with us and one is certainly not spilling the bean. But basically what ended up happening was Microsoft gave Apple a loan, a loan that saved the business. Is that Can you guys believe that, right? Literally bailed out their competitor. We talked a little bit earlier about how your competition can be an amazing creative advantage. But anyway, he literally gave him a loan that saved Apple because Steve Jobs knew that you got to think outside the box, right? You got to do something completely different and creative in order to do well in your business. And Bill Gates also knew that, hey, I have to have competition because it makes me better. And eliminating my competition is not going to make Microsoft a better company. Indeed, that was completely correct. And indeed, today they are two, you know, one ups all the time, a cat and mouse game that we all benefit from, right? Society benefits from the cat and mouse game because it's wonderful for people to have options on different computers, different machines, different experiences. So I beg you to help somebody today, reach out, do something creative. If you have a young realtor on the team, if you have somebody out of college that's interning, help them out. Give them some free information. Give them some love and attention. What you will see is that your potential for creativity will multiply because you're out of your comfort zone. That's not what you do every day, right? You don't help the intern out and that's not kind of your thing. But when you're able to step outside of your comfort zone, you will generate creativity. Maybe that's going to a competitor, ask for a loan. That's extreme, but it just might be that. Or it can be the ability to help somebody who has a problem. Now, the disease of self-doubt is the seventh thing that I'd like to talk to you guys about today. We touched upon it a little bit earlier, but what ends up happening is self-doubt eats up any creative initiative. And we need to learn how to deal with self-doubt so that it doesn't crush our creative spirit. We learned that we all have it in us. We believe it. I hope by now you believe, yeah, I, I got it. I got this near, this is going well. 
what you're talking about makes sense, right? So now what's going to happen is you follow some of these things, creativity is going to get going. And most of us, I'm, I'm included in that, and I'm supposed to be this creativity expert. But what's going to happen is at some point, you're going to have a bout of self-doubt and you're going to say, ah, I'm not going to do this, or that's not worth it, or it's too out there, or I can't ruin my reputation. You have to understand that the disease of self-doubt is going to come up. It's going to rear its ugly head, and we need to learn how to deal with it. One thing that you can do right now to help deal with self-doubt is the waterfall technique. And what that is, it's not too out there. I, I, just go with me. And I think you'll like it. What it is, is imagining water going over a waterfall. Water doesn't care what comes before it, and it doesn't care what comes after it. So what you do when you have self-doubt creep up, which is going to happen, and look, this is all of my notes from me feeling doubtful about an initiative or a particular problem that a client is having or you know whatever it is that comes up. I grab a pen and a piece of paper. And I start to write down, just write down sort of a flow like water of what it is that I'm, you know, nervous about or what I'm doubting. And as you go through and you start writing these things, you will feel that weight of self-doubt literally lifted off your shoulders, right? This is all you have to do. All you have to do is just sit down with a sheet of paper and start writing this stuff out. I do it every day. I do it several times a day. I like to fold my paper in half because it makes my problems feel smaller than using the full sheet. Uh, it, you know, whatever works for you, start writing these things down and you will start to feel a little less stressed out, a little less doubtful of what initiative you have in front of you. Now, after you've done that, you can look at it. You might have a few ideas in there of stuff that kind of came out while you were trying to purge yourself of self-doubt. So can we achieve the same greatness that a Steve Jobs or a uh, Susan Nabby of Cody or one of these amazing creative geniuses has? Absolutely, yes. The answer to your potential of the dreams that you have, of the life that you want, of the things that you want to do is 100% completely possible. We just have to learn that the self-editing mechanism that we have deep within us is going to pop up and try to tell you no. It's going to try to tell you no, you can't do it. And so it is our job to find a technique, the waterfall one with the piece of paper, easy. Anybody can do it. You don't have to learn how to do it. You just grab a piece of paper and do it. It is one of those things that can help anybody quiet the self-doubt monster and allow you to manifest creativity in everything that you do. I'd like to talk a little bit about making mistakes now because we are so conditioned to making no mistakes and trying to be so overly analytical that we're like, oh, look at me, I'm perfect, right? What ends up happening is we lose the ability to have mistakes become really amazing thing. So the invention of antibiotics is a really, really good story. What we had is somebody who was trying to, I think, cure the common cold. And, the, you know, uh, Fleming was the, uh, was the uh, professor. And uh, he had, you know, all of these things that he was trying to do and get done and, you know, exploring and different things. And nothing worked, right? Because he, he, he was just making mistake after mistake. So he said, you know what, I'm going to shut it down, take a break, a little number four digital detox, which in those days were not digital, just regular detox. And so he came back from vacation and noticed that some of the Petri dishes, because he didn't put them away, had like a mold on it, right? So he scraped the mold, put it under a, a microscope and discovered antibiotics. Literally, that's how antibiotics were discovered. The thing that saved millions of lives all over the world was discovered by mistake. So I ask you, what? look at what mistakes are going on in your business or your career today. And instead of just steamrolling over them, 
look at what potential value they might have. They might have some amazing value, amazing utility to you if you just stop long enough and allow them to take hold. When we look at our mistakes and really look at them, not just like, oh, I made a mistake, whatever. When we look at our mistakes, I priced that, ho- that house too low. The tenant in that commercial real estate unit uh, got out of the lease early because I forgot this or that, so on and so forth. What mistakes have happened? If we look at them carefully and we admit that we've made those mistakes, In those, we can find seedness of greatness, seeds of greatness that will allow for us to become more creative. So different mistakes yield different sort of uh, ramifications, but when we're able to stop for a little bit and look at those particular mistakes, we can have really great creative potential that occurs. Now, I I talk a lot about how the economy has been changing completely. And this one is something that has been somewhat controversial since I published the book. I get emails from just about all over the world with people saying, near this one, you had me the whole time until you mentioned this one, because this one's like kind of crazy. And I say, okay, well, you know, what what's going on? And people people tell me all the time, near, you know, product or service A meet, you know, buyer B and things get exchanged and that's how things work, right? Sometimes it's a little bit more complicated, but in essence, that's what it is. And what I say and what I fight for is that the economy is completely non-linear today. It is not, you know, product or service A meets buyer B. What ends up happening today is more like product or service A seeds J on Insta, right? And start to think about something. They talk to their friend C and goes all the way to Y. Y tells them, ah, that's kind of a cool thing that you're doing. It goes all the way back to that person and they end up transacting not with B, but with D, right? It is a complete tangled web. It used to be much more simple. The economy used to be a very linear economy, but now things have completely changed and they've gotten so much more complex. So where and how do we derive creativity out of this near? No problem. This is what we do. This is what we need to start doing. We need to start giving away more stuff. Okay. We need to start giving away more stuff free becomes incredibly popular in today's economy because our economy is non-linear. The more that you're doing to establish subject matter expertise or help in your community or give stuff away, the more you're doing that, the more profitable your business or your career is going to be. Now, it gets that way because buyers don't just align with a particular realtor anymore and move through the process. That's not how it works, right? A potential buyer might be looking online. They might be asking for a recommendation and so on and so forth. And I ask you, what are you doing to capture that attention? And you might tell me near, you know, I I don't want to spend money on that. That's not really what I want to do. But it is essential that you have a plan to capture free into profitability. It is really important for you to have a YouTube site where you do videos. That's what I do. I do uh, thousands of videos where I talk about literally everything in my book for absolutely free. You can go on my website and click on media and you can get everything that's in my book plus another thousand things that I've been working on all for free. And I give those things away because I believe that the economy is completely nonlinear. And I believe that there is magic and gold in that because it attracts people who say, yes, I got something for free. Yes, I love that guy. Yes, this is great. I'm going to bring him in. And that's exactly what you need to be doing in order to be competitive today. Now, I will leave you with this last little video, which I love. And I want you to really understand 
that coming up with creativity and understanding who you are as a creative human being is incredibly, incredibly important because the way that you do things is not the way that anybody else does anything, even if you do the exact same thing from an appearance standpoint, meaning that the way that you practice real estate is completely different than that next person. And anything that you can do to be more like Harriet, imagine a, a stick and a, and a spear, or imagine like this lady, a sequence of how to greet children in the morning. The more that you do that positions you as being you in a unique and differentiating way is the most powerful marketing differentiator that you can ever have. Because when we're true to who we are as human beings and why it is that we're doing what it is that we're doing, it attracts an immediate magnetism where people want to be around you because you are so good at what it is that you do. We need to find that element. That element always will come from creativity. I really hope you guys enjoyed the session. I tried to leave five or so minutes at the end for a Q&A, uh, feel free to look in the, uh, in the uh, uh, chat here. I got it on my screen. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear it. Uh, really appreciate being with, with your group. And I, I hope that, that y'all have some actionable items to use right away in your business or in your uh, career in order to become more creative. In here, I, I, I don't see any questions here, um, and I don't see any questions on Facebook, so um, I think we're good. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you so much. It was, uh, it was a real blast. I, I appreciate I appreciate y'all having me. All right, and uh, just a reminder for everyone, if you um, would like to view a recording of this webinar, it will be available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash screaltors. Thanks for tuning in.